Hello, everyone. I want to introduce you to the Portrait Project. It is our very next creative assignment, and I think you're going to have a good time with it because it pushes you to use some of the techniques we learned in previous um, demos that we did in class, um, such as when we did last week with lighting and colors and reflectors. So that's actually quite mandatory in this assignment. So um, I'm just publishing the assignment. And when you first come to it, or, there we are, um, you'll notice a portrait of a famous Henry Rollins. He's an old punk rocker turned comedian turned actor turned back into punk rocker. Uh, it's an old famous portrait from uh, Alton Corbjian. Um, and I think it's a good example to start us off here. It's high contrast. He's covered in some kind of pigment of some kind. And you can even see his old band. Uh, actually, that's that's, uh, that's Black Flag. As with it. He used to be the lead singer of the Black Flag. Um, if you guys recognize that band. Anyway, so this project we are going to be printing. So far, the printers are working, though we're, it's, um, we do need to do some updates to the computer that's, that you're going to be printing from. Um, but it should be done by the time you're going to be printing for this assignment. So it's not working like today, but it will be very, very soon. So for this assignment, you're utilizing lighting, lighting techniques you've learned over the previous few weeks, using both artificial lighting and natural lighting, reflected and not. You must create six or more different finished portraits and print them yourself. You do not need to photograph the same person for all six images, but it does help uh, it does help show off your variety of lighting techniques if you do use a similar subject matter. Now, I advise you if you use the same subject matter, you probably want to change up clothing and location because it does get a little boring seeing the same person just photographed, you know, with the same shirt and the same, you know, like hairdo or whatever um, under six different locations, six different lighting. You know, it seems more of like a tech demo than it does to be a creative assignment. So you don't have to shoot the same person either. If you want to do a series about a body of people like people have done firemen or whatever over the years that's that's a great idea um so it's really up to you i just say like show variety in whatever way you can with one individual or with a group that's that's great so you must capture six different lighting techniques that are listed below a few of them are similar but use different lighting sources um my examples at the very bottom of the page uh, show side lighting. Um, it's not required of you to copy their exact technique, but it's just examples. Um, these are just ideas of how other people have used the same kind of listed techniques for their own creative uh, results. So going down the list, I'd like you to have an image of artificial lighting coming from one direction. Now, artificial lighting is anything that's like a clamp light or a desk lamp or or anything that's artificial that produces light. It could even be car, car headlights. I've seen people get really creative with this. Um, speed lights or, or artificial lighting. Um, just be careful because artificial lighting can be as broad as something like overhead fluorescent lights. And yes, those, those are artificial lights, but man oh man, rarely do they ever make for compelling portraits. So just be careful about existing lighting in the room and seeing what, seeing what, what you can do to control the lights. So it, for this one, it's just coming from one direction. It could be from above, from the side, could be dead dead front in front of the model like coming right over the photographer's head it's kind of whatever your creative choices go for the very next one is very similar but i want you to bounce the light off a reflector so you have artificial light coming from one direction wherever that may be and then you're also bouncing it and filling in some of the shadows on the face or the the torso of your model now what is a reflector remember we used pieces of foam core in my class when we did the demo you can go out and buy one of those professional fold out reflectors and those are great they're they're pretty much the same as the foam core they get the same results except for those collapse really small which is very convenient for a traveling photographer but for was it a dollar 99 you can go out and buy a piece of foam core or a gigantic sheet of paper or pin up a gigantic white bed sheet if you want to and that can be used to bounce light just remember you want your your reflector sitting in some kind of light source so that bounces it back. If it's sitting pretty much in the shadow of your model, it's not going to bounce that much back. So just be aware of where your reflector is sitting. The next item is to use natural lighting from one direction. So similar kind of shooting style for the first one, except for you're using natural light. So that means the sun. Now this can be more challenging because you're requiring, you know, to either be out in raw sunlight or an overcast day where the sun is being diffused through clouds, or you can even be inside where you have like a window open or the blinds open and there's light coming into the window. And it doesn't have to be raw, harsh sunlight either. You could be an overcast day or the light is bouncing around your street and some diffused light is coming in through a window and it's that diffused soft light that you use. And that's fine too. It doesn't have to be a direct, harsh, raw sunlight if you do not want to. It just has to be natural light source of some kind. Some people have been clever over the years and used fire, they used like a campfire to light someone. And I said, touche, you're right. That is natural. It is fire is a natural emitting light source. So just be careful that fire 
it fluctuates in its its brightness quite randomly. And right when you think the fire is bright enough, you know, you got a bunch of logs on there, the, the, the coals are going hot, the flames are pretty tall. You start shooting and right when you get your 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 set up the way you like it, they starts to go down. It seems to fluctuate a lot. So just be aware of that if you want to use uh, something like that, like candles or whatever, because it can be really dim and unreliable. Just like earlier, I want to use that natural light, you know, the sun or the fire or whatever, and use it coming from one direction and then bounce the light off of a reflector as well. Almost any photographer that goes out and shoots in sunlight, they're definitely using reflectors because that fills in those harsh shadows and can soften it up a bit. So again, think about whatever kind of reflector you want to use. The last two images is I really just want you to have fun. Combine whatever you want. It could be artificial lighting, it could be natural lighting, it could be a combination of both. You could be using a bunch of LED lights. You could be using a bunch of neon lights. It's really your call. Um, I say just have fun. Just label them as just like fun or, or alternate or odd or whatever. Um, we're going to have a mid critique for this assignment, which I love mid critiques. And this is where we get to see what you're doing, how far you've progressed, and give you some feedback so you can respond to it. This is so you also don't get like blindsided during the final critique when you get all this feedback that could have helped you two weeks before. Um, so mid critiques are almost like are super valuable to students who are working on a long term project and just not sure how it's going. So you don't need the full project done by mid critique um, March 2nd. You just need a couple pictures and of course you can have more than two if you'd like. Um, so have those in this folder right here. This is the critique folder. This is what we're going to talk about during the mid critique and then have some images in your working um, your working folder. So just name it call of name it like portrait subfolder and then just throw a bunch of your working pictures in there and you as you imagine 30 is nothing 30 is minimal you can put more than that if you'd like uh, but that just shows that you're working through your foot your photographs you're shooting you're moving things around you're shooting you're moving things around again you're shooting you're you're making progress so don't forget to upload those images in your student folder under something called like portraiture or something like that portraiture mid critique would be great and then you're finished two or more here and these are the ones we'll critique in class um also just remember to um put your uh your last name in there that'd be great um yeah uh, if you don't have your last name on the file then it's just some random generated number now since we have a mid critique and a final critique you're gonna have to shoot more than one uh, photo shoot okay because it does us no good if you just shoot all six pictures you come into mid critique you get a bunch of feedback and then you do nothing in between the mid critique and the final that mid critique might as well have been your final critique right so i'm requiring that you respond to all the feedback you not only get from me but from your fellow classmates when we all kind of talk about everyone's project so plan for two photo shoots one between now and the mid critique and one between the mid critique and the final so you want to respond to that feedback um, the final critique is march 9th and this is where we turn in all of our images and it's going to be six finished prints and that's what we're going to hang up on the wall and critique them classic style okay so just make sure that the prints come out the way you like them if they look great on the monitor but they look a little dark on the print then just rerun them go a little brighter your these these computers we have in the lab are you know backlit 5k retina display screen so the shadows show up pretty good in those displays but when you print it on Epson Premium Luster, it's, it's a reflective material. You may not be able to see those nice shadow details or the reds may be a little darker. So you just like all photographers, when you go from the screen to the printed image, you have to tweak it a bit. You have to do some test strips. You have to print it a few times until it looks just right. And so you're an artist and I presume that you're gonna be handling your paper like an artist, okay? So you will also require to be turning in more working images. So you've, you're showing me that you've made progress and you also turn that into your student folder. Now I don't have the link up the link up for the final one yet, just because I don't want someone to accidentally put it in the wrong folder. So I'll wait till after mid critique, and then I will gray out this area so people know this is the past, <laughs> and then I will add the link for the final. So I just don't want people to accidentally throw it in the wrong spot. Now, just for helping me label when I go through and grade these, I you know I need to kind of know after critique, after we've spoken in class, like which one was the natural light and which was the artificial? Because if you do a really good job with window lighting or a really good job with clamp lighting, I may not be able to tell. If you used artificial lighting or natural lighting. So do me a favor and label them. And you can see I made some examples here. So it's just my last name. So natural light, natural light bounce, artificial light, artificial light bounce, and then fun, fun. Okay. And this will just help me know exactly what you've been working on. So you do not have to have a, a theme if you don't want, but I gotta say every photo project is just so much better if you got a theme. It also just makes it more exciting for you because you're making something that like is, is it's something you can exhibit. It's something ready for the gallery once you finish the assignment. It's something you can keep working on if you love doing it. It's, it can be a lifelong project if you like, or a month long or a six year, who knows, whatever. So um, these are just random ideas that people have done over the years or things that I found that like 
people have talked about and critiqued. So, you know, people have picked a certain block and actually highlighted all the shop owners of that block and did a portrait series of every one of them. People have done their teachers from their old high schools and if they lived in town, and which I think is really cute and charming. You just got to organize time with them. Uh, people have done firemen, like I said earlier, the elderly. There's something about the texture of wrinkly skin that just really makes for an interesting portrait. And you, if you've seen portraiture of the elderly, you know exactly what I mean. There's just something about that side lighting um, with like heavy um, textured flesh. It's just interesting. Um, athletes, people have a lot of access to athletes here at UK. Musicians, soldiers, handsome middle-aged men with turtlenecks. That's a stereotype that I've seen a million times, but it's funny. Um, play with clothing if you have to. I, this is not a rule. This is a, a suggestion. You know, like I say in every class, you know, probably not smart to shoot your dog, your cat, your horse, or your kid. You know, usually one of those four things. I, I should put the kid in there. Um, just because you're so you're so familiar with them and they're, you have this bond with them, we aren't going to see them the same way you do. And as soon as we see a cute dog, we're not like really looking at the photography anymore. We're just looking at the cute dog or the cute cat or the horse or the cute kid. So I'm not saying don't do that. Maybe you found some really fun, unique way of doing it. I'm just saying be careful because we've all seen them a million times and it's just kind of a trope that's really, it's really hard to get over that hurdle. Okay, so you've been warned. It's not a rule. It's just kind of encouragement to kind of steer clear if you can avoid it. Um, things to think about, the background, you know, what's in it? Can you be used, uh, used for the picture? Is it interesting? Does it add something to the story or is it really distracting? Do you need to use a shadow of the field or eliminate altogether and use like a backdrop of some kind, a white or a gray or a black or a blank wall or something like that? You know, is that something you need to use? Because that may draw attention more to the person and their and their clothing or vice versa. I say utilize it. If some you like, hypothetically shooting pictures of firemen, then maybe you want the truck in the background that's got a soft focus, or maybe you want all the detail. You shoot them flat against the truck where everything's legible. It's really up to you, but just don't ignore the background. That's so helpful for a lot of good portraiture out there. Um, so I will, once we go through the printing demo, I will have this little page, you know, right under here, under pages on how to print. So if you've forgotten, don't worry, that will be there. Um, I have some helpful little things here that may be helpful for you. I don't need to go through all of them. I'll just flip through a couple. And this is just more for lighting inspiration. These are printing charts. And this is the one we actually use for studio lighting. Now I'm not logged in, so you can't quite see it really well. But this is a really good printing chart for studio lighting with strobes. Now we're not using strobes in this class, but the principles are the exact same. Where is the light source coming from and what are the results? So this is a really, really helpful PDF that shows off um, how light bounces around, how soft or harsh light can affect your model. So think about, you know, how much you want to tweak your lighting source. DIY lighting tricks. This is a great page. I'm showing people how they make their own lighting gear out of like trash or, or like $10 worth of stuff makes this crazy soft box here. Look at this. looks so post-apocalyptic. It's great. Yeah, this is where they used a bunch of straws and cut them and put them in the cylinder. And when you shine light through it, it really funnels the light in one direction. So it's not a wide source of light. It's a very narrow source of light. We call this a snoot or a filter snoot. Um, so these are, and this is someone who's almost done with it. They're working, they're making one out of straws. So there's a million, see yeah, they're using the external light to hit. <laughs> Looks very um, Dr. Seuss of them. <laughs> but yeah, I love all this DIY stuff. Yeah, they made a grid system for their flash cellophane, which is something you should play later. It adds a vignette to your images. So this is here if you need it for a DIY. Um, let's, let, let's just glance over at one more here. So this is someone who's used, and I, I love this blog, um, and this blog post. It's because they literally use the most basic of basic household lighting. I mean, it couldn't be more cheap. In fact, you could probably find these in a trash can outside of an apartment complex. What they did was they grabbed two desk lamps, one with a natural light bulb, one with a what they call soft light or a warmer light bulb, and then one of those an LED light. When LEDs cast a very different kind of tone. Now this happens to be a fan that has LEDs on it. You can ignore the fan part, but it's the LED, the little LED uh, diodes that are going to be helpful. So what he does here, he is showing off his cameras. Let's go down the. There's his gear. Very simple, humble stuff. Nothing special. See that cool light. See that warm light, and see almost no light coming from here because it's so little. But it's very blue, but it's very weak. Okay. So he puts one light on his model and it looks like he's using the natural light bulb from this one. And he's metering off that. So this is the natural white tone he's sticking to. And so when he adds, you can see he put a little tinfoil around it to funnel it. He has the other lamp and he lets that fall off into the hot area. He's not gonna white bounce off this. He's gonna white bounce off the natural light bulb. So this is gonna be even redder than it naturally really is. So it becomes this secondary light that's this red flare, which kind of looks kind of interesting. And it is a little bright here, but. I like the flare of color it does back there. And again, he's playing with tinfoil to kind of 
angle it so it doesn't flare on his lens. And you can see the tin foil on his desk lamp here. He adds the LED light right over the top of the head. And remember, it's not that bright. It's very weak. It's a little accent light. So he turns that on and let's see the final result. Look at that. So it, it, it see she has dark hair, which is gonna disappear into this background. So actually that little LED light gave us a shimmer here that added to her, the shape of her head a bit. So we have the desk lamp with the natural light bulb here being our central white balance setting. And then we have that, that warm uh, desk lamp that's got the very, very hot light, which is not physically hot, but it's, he's letting it flare out super red. So the, the secondary colors are red. And then that little faint of blue from the LED. So again, that's, and he does a self portrait with the same setup, <laughs> which is actually really interesting because also the way you photograph people, different skin tones, different makeup, different hair color, different hair thinness or thickness or clothing. Look at the huge different results. Looks totally different. And that's just because of their skin, their hair, their clothing. You know, maybe the way he's turned his face a little bit. See, she's catching way more of the red light and he's got his arm up here. So this looks very, very little red as in this photograph. This is super red. And then he shoots the picture of an older person different kind of hair, very thin hair. The, the skin is bouncing light in very different ways and they're staring straight into the lens. So the, the red flare is not on the side of the face like it is over here, like on the very, very edge of a turned head and most of the torso. It's kind of like almost down the center hitting the little bit of the nose there. So that, yeah, I love that blog because it shows simple ways of playing with things. So this is how I'm breaking down the assignment. I'm gonna have it where me critique is worth 33%, uh, one third. Um, with that, I need to take that off. That's from COVID time. So eliminate that part. This is actually just means your responses during uh, mid critique. I want you guys to talk during mid critique. So that's what the two points are for. But the final critique is the is the bulk. You're coming back with the, you know you're responding to the uh, feedback you got from your mid critique and you did better. You went either you went back and had to reshoot everything, or you had to reshoot one of them, or you had to shoot none of them because they were fine and you just need to continue forward. So here's some rough examples of using a reflector right here and not using reflecting, you see it does fill in the light. Same here, this is actually a challenging photograph. They have the model is sitting in front of the sun, which is actually one of the worst photo setups ever. So look, they have the sun hitting the back of their head, which is causing a very warm flare. And then there's some ambient light in the atmosphere and the blue sky we have above us. And it's casting a slight blue tone here. So it's not a horrible picture, but it's, it's just not really well lit, it's contrasty. So they put a reflector between the model and the photographer. It's like, it looks like it's sitting in the lap of the photographer and man oh man, does that light it up with that warm tone from the sun. It does a much better job. So now the lighting kind of, the coloration matches now. Same here, this is another super challenging photo uh, shoot. Shooting with someone's back to the sun, it's like impossible. So what they did was they put the model right in front of the sun, the sun is behind their head. And then they turn their internal flash on to try to trick it a bit. So remember I talked about sometimes you want to use that fill light. Well, this is one of those situations where it helped them out. So here's the reminder that yes, you do want to use that Epson premium luster. That's the paper we're going to be using 50 sheets, which should be totally fine. So I want to show some examples of some great photographers. You may recognize a few of these. Let me get this set up here. Um, let's see here. Oh, 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 okay, okay. Now I'm comfortable now, nice and big. So uh, if I was doing this live, and I'm sorry I'm not, I like to play the guessing game and people recognize some of these celebrities, but since you're nuts here, I hope you recognize this is the famous musician Bjork. Now she was really big in the 90s and the 2000s. And she, and it's just a, it's just a celebrity. This is a David LaChapelle uh, photographing celebrities. Now he was famous for Rolling Stones and getting hired to do covers of magazines. And she was one of the hottest celebrities at the time. Uh, musicians, you know, Icelandic singer from the, the Sugar Cubes turned uh, solo artist. And he's always kind of cheeky and funny with his portraits. And there's a bunch of pictures of celebrities you'll notice from him. And I only picked a handful, but this is one I really like because he likes to show off his hand, like almost literally that's the hand coming in and showing the prop. And then he shows off, it's a lighting studio. It's not, they're not really outside in front of a, a cloudy sky. You can see those are actually the sea stands holding like the, the tree limbs here. So he's showing off, it's like artificial, it's fake. This is a shot in a studio, but it's still really awesome looking and colorful and everything. So he's kind of, like I said, tongue in cheek with his work. This is another one where he was using a house that was being demolished and he just brought a model there and did some crazy fashion work to make it look like maybe they just survived a hurricane and their hair stuck to everything. Um, I don't think I need to say much to get how funny or the, the setup of this picture. Good use of rules of thirds. This celebrity you may recognize, this is Angelina Jolie. Back in the late 90s, she was like this new celebrity, like showed up on the scene. And she kind of was famous for being like an odd girl out. You know, I know she doesn't kind of have that role now, but she did back in the day. 
and she was dating Billy Bob Thornton and they were a funny, strange couple that carried little vials of blood as necklace pieces around their neck of each other, their, each other's blood. So like she wanted to, she liked the idea of like, I'm the black sheep, I'm the odd one out. So when she got her picture taken for Rolling Stone, they literally brought in a sheep, a black sheep and had her pose with all black clothing down with the sheep. So it's kind of, it's supposed to be a joke. Um, it's really simple photograph, but there's a lot of tongue in cheek in there, like I said earlier. This one, I can't remember the name of this actor. He was, uh, I think he's Mexican American. Um, anyway, he was on uh, Motorcycle Diaries a long time ago. Uh, but what's more important is that you can actually tell from looking at this picture what they did to the model to get this portrait. So they put a flower in his ear and they spritzed his face with either water or maybe some oil or some lotion so that it becomes more reflective because wet skin or lotion skin is very reflective. And so you can see how shiny his face is, how shiny his hair is, but you can see they didn't do it to his shoulders and his hand. Look how non-reflective they are. So you can see where they did it here, you know, they, on his face, on his hair, and then they didn't do it on his arms and his hands and it's less reflective. So I don't think it's a bad photograph, but I love to use it as an example of like how you can treat skin and how it will respond to light. Now, some people just have really creative ideas for doing portraiture. This is someone you should recognize. This is Andy Warhol. Now he's more famous for his um, screen printing process, but he also did photography, he did video, he did sculpture, he did everything. This is why he's so famous. But um, his portrait series I wanted to show off, not because it's the most beautiful portraits ever. In fact, they're not, they're not that interesting. Which is interesting about them is not their individuality, it's the cumulative number. He was famous for being a celebrity photographer uh, or celebrity artist that would show up to parties, Studio 54. Every night of the week in Manhattan, you would run into him at huge galas and guard openings and movie premieres. And so he just knew everyone. He was like a who's who of celebrity friends. He was like the number one living artist of his day. So whenever people came to his studio, which is famously called The Factory, which you should totally look up, crazy history about that place, he would shoot people under the same setup, the same white wall with the harsh light, with this Polaroid camera. See this little Polaroid with his little stamp there? Same harsh light, right up against the white wall, right? Let's skip over these, these um, cover pictures, but here you go. So again, the pictures aren't that interesting, but it's the cumulative matter. And the fact that there's insanely famous celebrities, every single one of these people are hugely famous. You may recognize them, you may not. This is an ex-president of ours. You may recognize some, there's a Kentuckian right here. Uh, Wayne Gretzky, Pat Day. I, I don't know if he's a Kentuckian, but he's famous for doing horse racing. So that makes him a Kentuckian, I guess. Um, but he just shot, shot, and shot, and shot, and shot, and shot under the same one. And if you see his openings his, or his uh, gallery exhibits, which he's long dead, but his um, his exhibits still exist all over the world. They do touring shows. But in, in Pittsburgh, they have the Warhol Museum because he's originally from Pittsburgh. And they have whole walls of these Polaroids. And you know how big Polaroids are? They're like four by five inches. And they're all one of a kind because a Polaroid is a one of a kind print. It's not a negative. It's literally a carbon, it's a copy print. So that means every one of those shots was taken. So he shoots, shoots, shoots so much and makes these crazy, almost photo installations. That's a good way to think of them. So this is just a small cross section of, uh, of kind of how much he shot. And so again, it's not how cool the pictures are. It's how like, it tells a story like, oh my gosh, I wanna visit his studio or like this guy, I feel like when you look at his work, you're thinking about the celebrity that is him, uh, how you can get all these people in the studio. And again, you keep recognizing the same people because he just shot 50 shots of the same person. So again, this is what he's more famous for. I think his photography is actually more interesting than his screen printing. So just a couple more, we'll skip ahead. Here's this young man here you may recognize. It's actually uh, courtesy of the, the late uh, university. So there's a picture of him when he shows up to parties. That's what he looks like when he's walking around. He always has his little cameras with him. So uh, Jessica Al, uh, Al uh, Antola, um, if you're interested in the names of these photographers, you don't have to like try to phonetically write them off my, my voice. I put them in the file names right here. So that's, that's there for you in case you need to see, you know, or if you want to look them up later. So I really love uh, Jessica's work just because using real locations and photographing people on the spot and bringing a reflector, usually not bringing artificial lighting of any kind, just trying to use the landscape. And I think usually the landscape ties in a lot to the portrait. This guy standing there leaning on one hip and making this nice little shape here reminds me of the background with the top of the building and the horizon line here. Same thing with these kids here playing with these um, pogo, not pogo, um, crap, can't remember the name. Anyway, <laughs> steel, still is. Anyway, um, they're playing with sticks and you can see that they're, they're it's like the tall one on the far left with the hillside right here and this, the curving of the road. Remember I talked about curving lines are always interesting for horizons. Um, she's just naturally really talented when she shoots. She frames up really quickly. I'm not, I'm not sure how long they stood there for her, 
but she did a great job there. Um, I love this one because she actually frames, uh, this, this is a pair of shepherds and they have their little sticks they do to kind of keep their sheep in line. And you can see there's one little stick off to the side and you notice that that's why they're not centered. They're slightly off to the left so that there's room for the cropping with this little stick. So she was thinking about that. She thought the stick was like an, an appendage of his body. So included in this picture. This kid's st uh, sitting on a fallen over tree, looking over the horizon. So she got really low. looks like she's almost laying on the ground so that he's up in the sky. And I think it makes for a more interesting picture. Diana Arborist, famous for shooting New York City, um, wandering around. In fact, there may be some pictures you recognize. Even if you know, you've never seen the picture, you recognize it anyway. So um, she would go up to events like all over New York. Sometimes she'd be shooting for magazines. Sometimes she'd just be wandering around shooting her own thing. Which I highly advise you do the same thing. You don't need a reason to go out and shoot beautiful photography. But she would go to locations, events, and just walk backstage and say, hey, can I shake your portrait? Or not even ask permission. Just start snapping around and people thought she was press. You may recognize this one. You may have never seen the photograph, but it sure seems familiar. Have you ever seen the movie The Shining? Uh, Stanley Kubrick, the director of The Shining, was a huge fan of Diana Arbus, And I presume he had a print of hers because this literally looks like a carbon copy of the two, the twins in the movie The Shining, which you haven't seen that movie. Uh, help yourself out and go watch that movie right now. It's one of the best horror movies ever. But this is definitely an influence on that. So she found these two girls wearing the same thing and she had them pose against this or just step back and against this white wall. And so it washed out their necks here. You can see they kind of float a little bit, except for the white, um, I'm sorry, the black outfits kind of stand out. So luck, but also good direction. This one I love because it is the most awkward picture I've ever seen of a couple in my life. <laughs> She's slightly smiling, staring into the camera. The guy is not looking at the camera. In fact, he puts his leg on top of his girlfriend and puts his other hand on, on his belt. So it looks like he's trying to do a power pose. And though I'm way more interested in her because she's staring at us, because we're always more drawn to people staring right into the lens. She's got a slight smile on her face. And for some reason, she has her hand, two fingers on his pulse, on his neck. That may be accident. I feel like it's on purpose. So I feel like she holds the power, even though he's trying to show dominance. She holds the power. Right? And that may be complete coincidence, but it just makes for a more interesting photograph if you read into it more. So again, I'm gonna skip through here. I love this weird picture. Very strange. He's holding a toy grenade, I hope. I hope, I hope it's a toy. This is a famous one. It's on the cover of a lot of her books because the kids was just playing around in the park, in Central Park. And he's not centered. She's using a medium format camera, but he, she pushes to the right because she saw the young kid walking around the corner right here. So I presume she wanted to include them some, for some reason. So they're kind of cropped in a weird way. This is just a great picture of twins. I don't think I need to say anything. <laughs> you get it. But this is a picture of her working. She just shows up and starts shooting. This is just a pageant. I don't even know if she was invited to it. She just heard about a public event, showed up. She's using her hard flash and she sees she's DIYing it. She's taped the, uh, the rim to it so that it funnels the light a little better. And she's using her, tw her twin lens so she's looking down through the viewfinder. Picture of the end of a dancing competition. The proud winners posing in front of their trophies. Pretty damn cute, actually. They look very proud of their victory. She did shoot a color, a 35 millimeter later in life. And I think she actually did some really amazing work with using those old ectochrome, Kodachrome color stocks. Look at the skin tone, it's just so vibrantly red. And then the, the, the stucco walls are bouncing this, like, this blue back. And I don't think that's the natural colors of the scene. I think it's the film stock. And again, this is why people fall in love with the color film of the day. Um, and it's the same here, the blue is kind of popping in the back. But medium format is what she's most famous for, her black and white photography, which I showed you a bunch. Ava Arnold, I, there's a lot of pictures uh, that she shoots of Marilyn Monroe, and you're gonna see Marilyn Monroe a lot. And the reason I do that is because I wanna show how the same model, the same person can be photographed in so many different ways. And there's a reason why people like to shoot pictures of Marilyn Monroe, that she has this interesting kind of look about her, her hair, her skin tone, um, I don't know, like the hair just lights up with, with lights. And of course she was like the class A celebrity of her time. So you'll see, again, a bunch of different shots of the same thing and see how different they look. So this is, this is the picture of the photo shoot. There, there's Ava right here, setting up with the backdrop. And I presume they threw a little bit of pink light in the background because most art studios have a white and a black background. And it would be easier just to throw a little red light on the wall than have actually literally a huge pink wall. But you can see what she's wearing is affecting the way we see her skin tone because the camera has to meet her on something, right? So it's a, looks like a pearl or ivory kind of colored you know, dress, she's holding a white six. There's almost no color in this picture. So her skin tone becomes the most vibrant thing in the photograph, which is very different than other photo shoots because she's known for being super pale. Um, here's another picture with a 
strange background. It's a blue sky, or maybe it's a backdrop of a blue sky. I actually can't tell. But since again, it's just this, it's all this kind of cool tone that's very warm sheen on the on the blue sky. Her skin is the most vibrant part of the whole photograph. It's because she's wearing the white swimsuit and the lips, lipstick. Her hair has very little color to it. So in other pictures, it's her clothing, it's her hair that dominate the, the work. And again, she's famous for being super pale. So here's another picture of her where they had her wearing a black top and a white bottom. And so it almost looks like the, the, this black square is floating in the center of the frame and her hair is just the highlight of the whole thing. So it's really well framed. I love this. I feel like we're not cropping her at all. I feel like this is meant to be spaced right here as we go around the picture. And a nice neutral background of that wood pattern. This is a very strange picture of Marilyn crawling out of the reeds wearing a leopard dress. I presume she's supposed to be like a predator crawling out of the reeds. It doesn't look like an Avon Arnold photograph because Avon Arnold photographs are usually so formal. And then there's this funky, weird cosplay looking thing. But here's one that definitely looks like an Avon Arnold piece. Now we switched black background, white dress, the skin isn't as blown out, though it is kind of the most vibrant part, but I think the lipsticks, is, she's leaning forward into the camera. Her face is a little larger in this frame than maybe other pictures. See, her face is a little more dominant here. I think she's leaning into the towards the camera. Now that skin tone isn't as, as saturated. You notice that? Not nearly saturated. Yes, there's some darker editing you can do, but I think just naturally, just the shot itself, um, it's just unique ways of using props and backgrounds to kind of adjust that. Now she didn't shoot just Marilyn Monroe. She shot a lot of things. She was like world renowned and she got to travel the world. Um, again, this is where I'd ask you, do you know who this is? And if you don't, there's some hints. I think the ring is an obvious one. And I love that old vintage watch. I wish I could get my hands on that watch, but um, this is Malcolm X. And when he was uh, posing for a portrait for, I forget what newspaper she was shooting for. Um, she could have shot him dead on, which there's so many pictures of him like facing forward and she got really creative. She wanted to make it look like he's like, you know, wringing his neck, he's stressed, which his life was very stressful. He was constantly being, you know, followed by government agents and, and death threats. And, you know, that's how he ended up passing away. So she had a portrait where it's, it's a profile of him with his hand to his neck. And then also it shows off a little bit of history of him, his, his, his religious beliefs that were showing up. Um, and I, I heard that time on the clock was supposed to be important. Like we knew what time he was giving a speech or something, but I, I, I've totally forgotten what the time on the clock is supposed to reference. But she shot a lot of things outside of just portraits. I do love her series in China. Now she went to China really early on before Americans were really allowed to go there. She got early access and there's a book about her. It's called In China. And I believe we have a copy in the library. And man, oh man, did she like really make some interesting compositions. This one I love just because the insane depth of field. It is so narrow. In fact, I couldn't get a good copy. This is from the book and the book is starting to deteriorate. So this is the best I can get. But man, look at that. Look at the, the focuses here. Look how blurred out the hand is. And this is a little kid. So this f-stop must be like 1.2. She must be using a large format camera to get something like this. Look at the hair curlers in the background, all blown out. That's crazy. I love it. This one, I love the composition because it reminds me of like a 1900s like landscape painting. You have this huge horizon that's on the very, very top of the frame. In fact, like it's just barely important to have the sky at all. And then this big plane, and then you have your portrait down here. Now what she's shooting, and I can't remember the name of this, this group, but what they do is they, since they're shooting on these, the, the step, as they call it, or at least I would call it, um, that they need to hide their profile when they're hunting. Whoops, don't mean to do that. They need to hide their profile. So to do it, they get their horse to lay down while they're hunting. And so this is them like showing off the training they get for their horses. Richard Avedon, the most famous fashion photographer of all time. Here's a very young picture of him with his Rolleiflex. And here's a much older picture of him. This is one of the last portraits of him before he died, I think in like 2000 something maybe 1990 something, something. He lived a very long time, 1960s all the way. He worked for like 50, 60 years. He must've been super young when he started. Um, but he also too shot Marilyn Monroe. And again, same person, completely different results. I think with her, it's always clothing and background make the big difference. And her hair really never changed her whole career. So here they're, they're got her wearing this like, and I don't know if it's black or green or blue, but it's a really dark dress. And it's got this reflective like beading material. So it's super contrasty. In fact, all we're getting is just the reflection from the studio lights. We're not get, like the rest of it is just pitch black. We have her staring off to the side, which actually is a story. Apparently this was a shot in between photo shoots when she wasn't expecting the photograph to go off. And so she has this blank stare, which he ended up using this picture. I'm sure she probably didn't like that, but she was famous for her opioid abuse. So maybe this is a more telling like portrait of her. In fact, I think this is the most honest portrait of her I've ever seen. Um, again, since this is the clothing they have in her, the super dark dress, the skin is like almost blown out pure white. 
So again, it makes a huge difference what kind of materials in your landscape. Andy Warhol, you're going to see a lot of pictures of him just because he is a very, very photographed uh, artist and his hair and his skin has a very specific way it bounces light. And it's specifically, he had, he had health issues that affected his skin. So it's kind of really pasty. And I don't mean that in a negative way. That's how he described it, but it doesn't bounce light in the same way it bounces light off most people. I'm skipping ahead, skipping ahead. I mean, this is, he shot the dead guineas. I always thought this was a George, uh, young George Clooney. It is not, <laughs> it's just some writer or actor. I can't remember who it is, but I love that the, he blew out the background. He put a really bright light on the white wall behind him and it blew it out pure white. And a um, little bit of his bouncing off the shoulder of the actor, but he has a light in the forward round. Steve McCurry, the famous uh, photographer, the National Geographic photographer, shot with side lighting. And some of that light is hitting the white wall, but it's not bright enough to make it pure white. So it makes it a gray tone. So again, you could turn a white wall gray just by giving a distance from your light source. Super high contrast. I love how it goes from pure white to pitch black and anything in between. It's almost like a yin and yang look of this. And I love that the ponytail goes over the shoulder. So this is a very strange portrait. I dig. I very, I very much love this portrait for how contrasty it is. He did do a series where you went around the world and photographed people against the same backdrop, just a white sheet. And he did it because he wanted to eliminate all context. He's like, these people are who they are, what they wear, what they, what they do. So it looks universal. You, know, you can't really tell where they are. You can guess from like their nationality or whatever their clothing. Uh, but he wanted to like, put it on an even playing ground. I thought it was a really charming idea to go around the world and shoot people against a simple white background with the same lighting setup every time. So there's a million pictures. I could show you more, but I think like if you're really interested, you should look it up. Skipping ahead. Everyone recognizes this dude. This is Bobby Dylan. Skipping down. Oh, this is from the white background series. This one, I just love the cropping. They had to, they played with this model's hair. I presume they put like a box or some foam core or something and pinned her hair around it. And then they cropped it beautifully. So it fits the frame. That is not by accident, for sure. It makes her neck look way longer, I would say. It looks like this big shrub. Um, and then like, this is the branch. This is a picture showing of like one of his setups. So you can see the, the paper roll down and multiple lights. There's a big soft box here in the foreground. And then the little spotlights kind of coming down. <clears throat> Cecil Beaton, and I'll skip through him a little bit, but here's a picture of him with his eight by 10 camera. He shot in the 1920s, 30s, early 40s, um, but he loved dramatic lighting. He loved like classical compositions, like almost like old paintings. Um, so this is a, a really old portrait of Orson Welles when he was crazy young. Um, and if you know anything about him, he was the film director, Citizen Kane and all that kind of stuff, but he also did the Day the Earth Stood Still, that old radio show that terrified America and people thought aliens were attacking America because they couldn't tell it was fiction radio. But they lit him like an old classic painting, the skull underhand, the light source behind him. This could be like a, yeah, literally like a Dutch painting of, of an artist, stark lighting. Lucky, lucky, Marilyn Monroe again. Again, black background, a prop, white clothing with the white little flower. So she looks super pale compared to the background. I presume this bird is artificial. I can't imagine it's real. This one I love because the, usually people's faces are the most like contrasty or reflective thing you see in a lot of portraits or the things that capture the human eye. But since he put like foil or silk or something over every inch of every single thing and all the pearls, her face is probably the least interesting part of the portrait. It's like all this texture is like just catching my eye and it's, it's shininess. And you can see something like this is so similar. Another one, uh, I think this is uh, Marlon Brando, from my understanding, a young Marlon Brando, and I could be wrong, but it sure as hell looks like him. And it's a picture with the one single light coming down straight from above and a gigantic reflector in the foreground, like right between the photographer and the subject. So the light is bouncing off the ceiling or from the ceiling source and hitting him in the face. So it's filling in some of the shadows. And I'm sure the book is bouncing some light in his face too. Salvador Dali poking through one of his, his own art paintings. This is one of his odd paintings. This is just smart shooting. If you're shooting out in the broad sun daylight on the deck of a, a naval vessel, the HMS something, this is HMS here, um, your, his face should be in pitch black shadow, but he got lucky. The sun was hitting this flag that he was, the sailor was sewing. He was fixing this, um, this flag. The light is bouncing off it. He's got a natural effect and it's filling in all that shadow. So his face is filled in with beautiful light thanks to some randomness. I, I don't know if it's posed. It probably isn't, I would imagine actually. It's probably just good luck. And camera uh, photographer being ready to shoot at any time. Um, this is Philip Halsman as the photographer, then not the person everyone should recognize who this is. Um, he would shoot, he likes to get really tight on people's faces, but I love that you can see his pen 
Albert Einstein's pen is under his shirt. He didn't take it out for the portrait, which I think is kind of charming. Skipping down. Another picture of Salvador Dali, of course, playing with the, the um, studio assistants. So they're sticking his arms through his jacket. I've seen people rip his, this idea off a thousand times, which is funny to see. Um, but yeah, it loves to get really tight on the, the models here. This is uh, Andy Warhol, super contrasty. You have the light hitting the back wall and a very harsh light kind of over the back of Andy Warhol's shoulder. So it's casting over his nose, but not hitting anywhere near the other side of the face. This one I love because the depth of field is insane. This f-stop's got to be like 64 or something that our cameras can't do. Right, I'll zoom in and show you. Look how the, the this is in focus, then you know the finger on the trigger, and then go back to the watch in the background. Even though my, my resolution isn't perfect, but this is in focus too. So everything's in focus. So this must have been a super bright situation, and the f-stop must be stupid high. And again, this is a portrait of Salvador Dali for Life magazine, because Salvador Dali had a very strange sense of humor, but I think his, the portraits of him are always a lot of fun. Here's another picture of Salvador Dali <laughs> shot by, um, by Philip Marcus. It's, you've probably seen this one. And the only thing I know I heard about this is that it took him three or four tries to get this portrait. They threw everything into the frame. These poor cats had to be thrown into the water multiple times. I imagine the studio assistants setting this up had to run around and wrangle angry wet cats. I'm sure they were being scratched up and you know, deservedly so. George O'Keefe, a famous portrait of a famous painter. Um, this is, I think this is a great portrait of her because it's so to the side that it's cropped really well here. And harsh lighting on the kind of weathered skin. She, she's famous for being, I think it's New Mexico or Arizona, one of those two states. She's like the patron saint of that state. So she's being someone who loves the sun. She did age with heavy, heavy textured skin, but she loved getting her portrait taken because her husband or her partner was a world-class uh, photographer. In fact, he made photography, um, a, a household like art um, standard. Um, I'm trying to remember if it's Paul Strand or I always forget her partner. See the Paul Strand or Strauss. I think it's Paul Strand. Anyway, um, this is one of the pictures of her where the black uh, dress, she's always wearing black. She always wore black, even though she was out in the desert all the time. And so you, this is one of the pictures where you see the contrast between the skin, the background, and this pure black tone of this dress. So it's just kind of interesting how that, that works out. Yusuf Kirsch. This is a portrait artist, and I only have a couple more left I'm gonna show you here. Um, but he would shoot these headshots and he would use very consistent lighting with all of his models. So this is a picture of Ernest Hemingway. You may recognize this famous angry old writer. And he, has, he always has like three lights, not always, but usually has three lights. One over, um, one right in the front, kind of cast straight down in the face, and then two, one on either side, really far back. So we have this heavy contour here. Look at that contour. And when he uses the same lighting technique on different people, he gets different results depending on their skin, their, their hair, their, just their clothing. This is Andy Warhol, you may recognize. Remember I told you about his thin hair and his pasty skin as he described it. It bounces the light so different than, than Hemingway. So different, same lighting setup, exactly the same lighting setup, but completely different results. So skin tone and clothing makes a huge difference. Famous picture of Winston Churchill in parliament during the war, which is a power move to show a picture of the the, um, the prime minister staying in London during the bombing of London when they were doing the Blitz. Um, so this was obviously meant to kind of raise the morale of the, of the, of the English citizenry or, the, or I guess the empire at the time. And they put a light on the back wall so it glows and shows off the wood paneling wall of his office at parliament. I love this picture. Um, the main reason is because it shows off what kind of lights he uses. If you look close, you can start, you can guess. Look at here, see the smoke, it's swirling. It's not frozen in time, it's swirling. So this is a long exposure. Maybe not long, but it's like 30th of a second. It's not a harsh, quick flash, right? So he's not using flashes. He's using solid hot lights, which is probably really hot, <laughs> like movie set lights. But the same kind of lights we probably use if we're not gonna use strobe lighting. So that's that swirl tells me that there's a duration of the exposure. It's a long, it's a slightly longer exposure. He had a theme of shooting pictures of people. He shot a lot of America. Uh, but Yusuf would shoot people to the right or to the left and then have a scene happening on the other side in the background and have a light coming from on the side. You notice that a lot here. Look at this. He does it a few times. Look at that. Guys on one side, the scene going on the background and a light coming from around the corner. Pretty consistent, eh? <laughs> I think it's a good idea. This picture, I don't know who this person is, but I love it because it looks like the same lighting he did for everything else, but one of the lights didn't go off. See, there's no light on the right. See, same technique he used earlier. Just one light didn't go off. So I don't know if that's a mistake or if that's on purpose. 
It looks very strange without it, right? It looks uneven, like a missing tooth or something. Same lighting technique, but with that heavy contrasty hair and that weathered skin, it looks so interesting. I'm gonna skip over this artist, but I'd love to show this one just because it sure looks like a, a famous celebrity we know in our time period, right? <laughs> this is another one where I'd ask you like name that celebrity, though it's not him. This guy was photographed a hundred and something years ago. Um, oh God, I'm trying to remember the name of him. Ah, he was in Holes. He's a very angry man. He was in the Indiana Jones reboot movie that most people didn't like. Ah, yeah, I'm forgetting his name, but it sure looks like him, doesn't he? I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about. Let's skip over here. We're taking too long here. Dorothea Lang. You guys should all know her work. This is a picture of her in her like huge eight by 10 uh, fold out camera that she can look through. It'd be out in the sunny day, but still be able to see the exposure. This is what she's famous for. You should all recognize this picture. Um, the picture of the, uh, they, they sent photographers across America to photograph what real American life was like. And this was kind of a propaganda thing to do, which everyone agreed with at the time, but it was to show that there were hardships in America. And they bring those pictures back to DC and back to the press of the East of New York Times and the Washington Post, to show that people are suffering in America and um, they shouldn't be ignored. So they sent, the government sent dozens and dozens of photographers paid for their gas, paid for everything to just go out and shoot, 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 go everywhere, anywhere. Kentucky, they, a lot of them came to Eastern Kentucky. There's a lot of them that spent a lot of time in Eastern Kentucky, Colorado, Denver, the Dust Bowl of the West. Um, so she shot a lot of that. She was one of the members and she was really clever about making portraits of people under difficult lighting circumstances. She should put her camera right into the tent of people's houses, shooting shadow areas under the umbrella. So she metered so that this would blow out a bit, but this is wonderful light bouncing off of whatever the ground is underneath her. It must be the concrete or something or gravel. And it's getting some great light here. And then a little bit of light diffusing through the umbrella. So it's just a wonderful touch. Again, shooting through the tent. I love this one because it looks like a portrait of two, but uh, he's definitely showing off his SSA tattoo. <laughs> but yeah, so, so, ah, flip like that. There you go. Um, I love the lady back there kind of in this, this great pose. Skipping around. High contrast. This is a difficult shot. Shooting someone with high noon lighting where the sun is way up top. So it puts these long shadows. But the last minute, he put his hand across his face and he's walking up a post or a pole or something. And so his skin almost becomes the same texture as the wood. You almost don't even notice it. How the skin is the same texture as the wood. It's that contrast. Steve McCurry. Now, you guys should recognize his photography because he shot this the most famous National Geographic photograph ever taken. Uh, it's called the famous called the Afghan girl. I think it was either taken 1984 or 1986. I always forget which year. Um, but there's a lot of reasons this picture is amazing. And he had a lot of luck that day. He was shooting. If you look at the eyeballs, you'll see his setup to the window to the light. He said he was shooting in, into this, like he found this like open vendor booth. He was at a market and they just had, it's kind of like a garage door was open. And so he just had the women or he actually shot dozens of people, dozens of women, but he shot dozens of people. They sat there with the gigantic garage door, I'll call it that, open to the right. And so it made this diffuse light hit there. So he was not using artificial light. There's no strobes going off. There's no nothing. This is light bouncing around the room, but mainly coming from one side. And of course this woman has like these insane eyes. She has like every color of the rainbow in her eyes and it bounces, it re repeats what is going on with the background and the clothing. Look at this orange. This like rusty red and then the green, but it's the same green as the background. Like that can't be coincidence, right? This is before Photoshop. So it's like, this looks like something Photoshopped all these tones to be the same, but they're not actually these two tones. It's just coincidence, it's luck, but it's also talent because the guy knew what he was doing. He was really good at photographing kids. Now, the reason I include this in here is because there's multiple ways of photographing kids. You can look down at them and they look, they look small, they look meek when, you, when there's an adult looking down at a kid. Or you can get on the same eye level as them and shoot up at them or at the same eye height and they look more powerful. So think about that when you're looking at portraiture of kids. Whoop, that's lagging on me, come on. Don't you crash on me. Okay, okay, we're back, okay. When he's looking down, they look smaller. They look like more menial to us. And this is kind of what you know political advertisements are. You always, usually when you photograph a political, uh, figure you shoot up at them so they look taller bigger than the viewer it's the same thing with kids they can look smaller if you do the opposite so think about that when you photograph someone who's smaller or, or something that's smaller than you they will look more meek and powerless and this is one where he's getting a little lower shooting up up at the kid but the shell of the field and the kid looks a little more powerful right as opposed to us looking down at the kid this is a heavy steep angle looking down he looks way more young and tiny right so there's so many different ways you can shoot portraits of people height makes a huge difference so he did shoot a lot of pictures of people 
I think his kid pictures are actually more interesting. Um, and not, not all of his adult, or, you know, his Afghan picture is great, but I do love the pictures he did of children. I love this one. This one could look so different in many different ways. It's the fact that he got down on the ground at the same eye height as the kid. So then you have these huge adult figures reaching down and shaving his head, kind of like we identify with the child, right? So if we were standing up and photographing down at the kid, we'd be like the adults looking down at the kid, right? So the viewer identifies with the position of the photographer. Totally utilize, uh, utilize that. Um, Renik Tejgiska, Tejkacha. I always mispronounce this Dutch or Icelandic photographer, but this is one of her series she did where she photographed um, what we call it preteens when their hormones are taken over and they're just to they get that growth spurt and everyone's just uncomfortable with their body. You're just like, ah, oh, nothing fits me anymore. And my voice is cracking. That's the idea. So it gets these kind of awkward teens and of course gets their permission, but puts this really heavy lights on them so that they like are stark or standing out. And some kids can own it. Some kids feel a little uncomfortable and some kids own it. Like I said, this is in Brazil and that kid's rocking it. <laughs> but the harsh light just makes it look otherworldly, right? You know, it doesn't look like natural light. And it isn't. Um, now, Rennick did other pictures of different series about military, and they're okay. I don't, I don't think they're as interesting as the pictures of the kids, um, just because they're so strange. These pictures you may recognize. You ever been to 21C Louisville? Great portrait. Um, it's 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 um, Hendrik uh, Kirsten. He shot a photograph of his his daughter all the time. That's what it is. This is his daughter, and she she has this kind of face. She looks like you know. I know he's Dutch. She looks incredibly Dutch. Um, but she reminds me of old Flemish paintings, and I think she knows that, and he knows that. So he posed her with really minimal clothing and just simple little things on her head or on her neck or on her shoulder or on her hand. So she looks like old Flemish paintings. So they're really DIY. She's not wearing anything that's old, like re re Renaissance or whatever, her hand gesture, a little coin under her finger. Looks like an old, like, Catholic, you know, or medieval painting, right? And this is just bubble wrap. This is just a book sitting on her head, you know, with no text or anything but it's a book nonetheless. It kind of looks like a medieval clothing. Lampshade, toilet paper rolls. This is the one that 21C Louisville has hanging up all the time. And they're big, they're like huge, like five feet tall. Disposable headgear for when you're working in a kitchen or a shopping bag. <laughs> Ridiculous, yes, but looks so classic at the same time. These are disposable table settings. They just cut a hole in the center and they give her a single earring, which very much reminds me of Vermeer paintings, the one pearl earring, right? And this is the reference, like Vermeer paintings, the girl with the pearl earring, his daughter. He shot it in the same way, lighting from one side. I'm gonna show you one more artist. This is uh, Loretta Lux, famous German-American photographer. And she would shoot pictures of her friend's children and then Photoshop them into different backgrounds. Uh, she did a little bit of Photoshopping. It's very mild that you wouldn't notice unless I told you. She slightly enlarges their heads and slightly enlarges their eyes, just a little bit so that they look like the old fairy tale drawings and etchings she saw growing up in Germany, which does kind of remind me of like anime cartoons a little bit, like their heads are a little enlarged, the eyes are a little enlarged. So that's what she does. Now she takes their clothing and their skin tone and uses it for the tones for the background. So if you look at them, they're very consistent. <laughs> they're like one toned. And the Photoshopping isn't perfect. You see the shadows are a little wonky on the cat, but again, the heads are slightly enlarged. They're almost like fairy tale looking. You almost wouldn't, like I said, you wouldn't notice it if I didn't tell you. And you'd probably be like, what is odd about this picture? This one, I love the colors of this one. Look how, like, pink, flesh, green, pink, flesh, green, pink, flesh, green. And look at the background, pink, flesh, green. <laughs> That's all the same tones of this hidden garden. Everything's the same tone. The water and the dress, the skin tone and the, and the ground and the sky. This is one of her more famous ones because it's so strange. It looks like a politician. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Looks like a politician. <laughs> But again, it's made from the same tones, the blues and like, uh, I'm not sorry, not the blues, the browns and the kind of flesh tones in the hair are used to kind of tone the background a bit. So it's, it's meant to repeat a bit. Okay, so I've shown you enough stuff for today, um, but I want you to think about with your portrait assignment, um, it could be really anything you want. I mean, it's, it's great when you have a theme and I really encourage you to do so. Not required, but encouraged because it makes for really compelling body of work. So please hit me up if you have any questions, okay? I'm um, always happy to talk outside of class or via email, okay? Talk to you later.